Good morning and welcome to this, the third Sunday in Lent. Today we have our Celtic Communion Liturgy and we begin with the Territorial Acknowledgement. As we gather here today, we wish to acknowledge that we are on land that at the time of contact was the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy and the Anishinaabe peoples. We thank all the generations of Indigenous people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. May we who dwell on or visit this land also be good stewards, honoring those who came before us and as we seek to move forward in truth and reconciliation. We come in the service to God. We come to God who has come to us in Jesus. We come with our faith and with our doubts. We come with our hopes and with our fears. We come as we are because it is God who invites us to come. And God has promised never to turn us away. Holy God, maker of the skies above, lowly Christ, born amidst the growing earth, spirit of life, wind over the flowing waters, in earth, sea, and sky, you are there. O hidden mystery, sun behind all suns, soul behind all souls, in everything we touch, in everyone we meet, your presence is round us, and we give you thanks. When we have not touched, but trampled you in creation, when we have not met, but missed you in one another, forgive us, and hear now our plea for mercy. The creator of the world watches over you when you're waking and you're sleeping. The savior of the world ransoms himself for your sins and for your eternal life. The spirit of the world dwells within you to guide you and keep you safe. The God of love and mercy grant you the grace of pardon, wholeness, and peace through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Come, Father of the poor, come, light of our hearts, come, generous spirit. By the glory of your creation around us, by the comfort of your forgiveness within us, by the wind of your spirit eddying through the years within these walls, renew us so that we come glad to this celebration. God holy, God strong and holy, God holy and deathless, have mercy on us. And now for our Lenten wreath liturgy for this, the third Sunday in Lent. During Lent, we remember the events that led up to the crucifixion. Jesus had come to bring hope and light to the world, but at every step, there were those who could not accept the power of that light. He brought grace and forgiveness, but these gifts were often rejected by those filled with great love for other things. Every time one of them turned away, a little of the light that had come into the world was put out. And now we have the Lion's Spark reading with Tracy. From the Spark Story Bible, The Ten Commandments. The Israelites were on their way to the land God had promised them. It was a long way. With God watching over them, the men, women, and children walked and walked and walked over the hot, dry land. When they got tired and needed rest, they would set up tents and camp together under the stars. While they were camping at the bottom of a mountain called Mount Sinai, something incredible happened. On the morning of the third day that they were there, a dark cloud covered the mountain. Crash, boom, bang, lightning and thunder filled the sky. The people were afraid. Suddenly, the voice of God called Moses. God asked Moses to climb to the top of the mountain. So Moses grabbed his walking stick and climbed up, up, up. 
When he got to the top of the mountain, God spoke. God said, Moses, listen up. I have important rules for you and the people to live by. You can turn to this list to know how to love God and each other. Do your best to follow this list. It won't be easy, but I am with you and I love you. Then God gave Moses a list of 10 special rules called the commandments. They were, I am God, the only God. Honor me above all things and people. There are no other gods for you, only me. My name is special. Don't use it with bad words or mean talk. Take a day of rest each week. Call it the Sabbath and make it a special day for God. Show your mom, dad, and others who take care of you love and respect. Don't hurt others with your words or actions. If you get married, you must be loyal to your husband or wife. Don't take things that aren't yours. Tell only the truth about your family, friends, and even those you do not know. Be happy with what you have. Don't wish for things that other people have. And with that, the dark cloud went away. Moses walked down, down, down the mountain. The people were still scared from the dark clouds and thunder. But Moses said, don't be afraid. God has given us special rules to teach us how to live together in peace. Moses told the people about God's rules and they did their best to follow them. The psalm this morning is Psalm 19. teaching is perfect, restoring my soul. God's decrees are sure, making wise the simple. The Holy One's precepts are right, rejoicing my heart. God's are pure, giving light to my eyes. for God is clean, enduring forever. The Holy One's judgments are true, altogether just. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey in the comb. By them is your servant warned, for in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern unwitting sins? Above all, keep your servants from arrogant sin. Let them not control me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of great offense. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in your sight, O God, my strength and my Redeemer. with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, 
This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we read the passage that is traditionally known as the cleansing of the temple. Although this passage is found in all of the Gospels, including Mark's, which we are reading through this year, we turn to John's Gospel for today's reading as John fleshes the passage out, where Mark is shorter and to the point. The cleansing of the temple seem to be the go-to verses when we want to explain away outbursts, righteous anger, or as I read, Jesus flipping tables is not an excuse for your online rants. A Facebook post using this excuse, as I read, might say something like this. Sorry if this comment about fill in the blank doesn't sound nice, Jesus wasn't exactly nice either when he kicked people out of the temple and threw around tables. We have to remember that Jesus' forceful actions end with him saying, stop making my father's house a marketplace in Mark 2.16. And one chapter later in John 3.16, we hear, for God so loved the world. Jesus knew what he was doing It was not a spur-of-the-moment fit of rage from someone who loves us. He already knew what was going on in the temple. This was a teaching moment to make his point, which was that he would not just cleanse the temple, he would become the temple. It would change the way in which we see and love God and Jesus and the way we would see and love God's people. This required something that would get everyone's attention and make the point, and that he did. I have a few questions that I want to answer about this passage in this sermon. Let's begin with the title. Is the cleansing of the temple the right title? Cleansing, that is to clean the temple, is probably not the right word. The answer to the question, would it remain clean after Jesus' actions, is no. The temple would carry on with the ritual sacrifices and changing people's money. The answer to what really happens lies later in the passage when Jesus says prophetically, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus said this in order for his disciples to remember as we read later in verse 22. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. What we then have is not a clean temple after Jesus' death, but a new and different temple. The title could be Jesus the New Temple. He wanted the disciples and us to remember this. If I were to ask you to name a healing or teaching, there would be a host of answers. But if I asked you to tell me about what happened in the temple, you would get specific about Jesus' forceful actions. Point made. I remember going to a lecture that Bishop N.T. Wright, the New Testament scholar and writer who commented on movies about Jesus, He said that he couldn't believe what the writers and actors had done in making Jesus look so boring. What we have in today's reading, as we always have, is far from what a boring Jesus might be. Jesus is a great healer, teacher, prophet, but foremostly 
He is the Son of God who is the new temple. My second question is, what does Jesus mean when he says, stop making my father's house a marketplace? The King James Version has den of thieves rather than marketplace, which I think has more of a ring to it. Perhaps I like den of thieves because it is an expression I grew up with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or maybe I'm just getting old. This phrase, den of thieves, may make us think about what we do in church today. I don't think we have a marketplace here at St. Mark's. We may think of the Sundays before Christmas when we are selling church calendars and Advent candles. These are ministries of the church and we all benefit from them. What was going on in Jesus' time was a profit-based temple business that made the business the point of being in existence rather than the worship of God. My final question is, what is the cleansing of the temple, as it is called, mean for us? Jesus, the new temple. In a phrase, we are to remember what Jesus did. The word remembering in Greek is used later in John 22, 33, and 12, 15, where remembering takes place after Jesus' resurrection. In this way, the first readers of John's gospel were like us. We have not experienced the human Jesus directly, so we remember what he said and we believe it to be true. The early Christian writer and bishop Ignatius said that we should try and find ourselves in a Bible passage. In Ignatian Bible comp contemplation, you place yourself in a biblical scene and try to become a part of it by using your imagination. We might find ourselves in the story as a seller or a money changer, a buyer and a worshiper, a questioner or a disciple. There's only one person we can't be, Jesus. We can't be Jesus. Jesus is God. We can't be God. The next time you use righteous anger, throw stuff around, say that there is a place for violence, or post something on social media with colorful or violent language, ask yourself, are you trying to justify these actions by what Jesus did in the temple? Jesus died on the cross once and was raised in three days for us and did it for all time and all people. We can't duplicate that, no matter what we do, promise or give to God. Jesus' actions in the temple that day were prophetic as they spoke about the temple of his body. Jesus' body is the church, and we are called into love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control as members of his body. And if you still think Jesus had an outburst of righteous anger and as a follower, so can I. Well then, when we are short of communion wine, we'll know who to call. Amen. We continue in our service with affirmation of faith number one. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of male and female. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman's womb, servant of the poor. He was tortured and nailed to a tree. A man of sorrows, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of life everlasting. Amen.
The prayers of intercession are form one, found on page five. We pray for Linda, our primate, Anne, our metropolitan archbishop, Susan, our bishop, Peter and Lynn, our priests, and Richard, our deacon. You are above us, O God, you are beneath. You are in air, you are in earth. You are beside us, you are within. O God, you are in a betrayed and suffering people of our world, just as you were in the broken body of Jesus. We pray now for all that concerns us as we gather at table together. O Christ, we bow before you in a sheltered house of prayer, once more to give thanks. Together we gather, celebrating your presence and creation around us, in the flowing air and in the fertile earth. Christ, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Jesus, you sat at table with the betrayed and rejected of Palestine. We pray for those today who do not feel welcomed in their daily lives. Christ, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Jesus, you identify with the naked and with those who had no place to lay their heads. We pray for the thousands of homeless men and women, old and young, in our towns and in our cities. Christ, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Jesus, you belong to a refugee family. We pray for the millions of displaced people in our world and for the opening of borders to the nationless. Christ, in your mercy. Oh, Jesus, you cared for our companions and for the little ones who surrounded you. We pray for the dependent ones whom God has given us to care for. Christ, in your mercy. Oh, Jesus, you who walk with the wounded along the road of our world's suffering, we seek your grace of healing for the broken people and places of our world. Christ, in your mercy. Hear our oh, Jesus, you pray that we might be one as you and the Father are one. We pray that during the week we may feel at home with you and one another, with you in our midst. Let us offer our own prayers, both spoken and unspoken. In the week ahead, please remember the following in your prayers. Cynthia, Tom, Johanna, Ryan, Debbie, Sarah, Patricia, Eunice, Lee, residents and staff at the State of Retirement Home, the Lodge family, Doreen, Paul, Mindy, Brian, Gail. Christ in your mercy. You're <clears throat> Teach us now, O Christ, to pray as brothers and sisters. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Gracious God, we know your power to triumph over weakness. May we who ask forgiveness be ready to forgive one another. In the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're using Eucharistic Prayer B, found on page 11 in your booklets. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, for you made us, and before us you made the world we inhabit, and before the world you made the eternal home in which, through Christ, we have a place. All that is spectacular and all that is plain have their origin in you. All that is lovely, all who are loving, point to you as their fulfillment. And grateful as we are for the world we know and the universe beyond our understanding, we particularly praise you, whom eternity cannot contain, for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus. For his life, which informs our living, for his compassion, which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking, which contradicts our harmless generalities, for his enduring presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness, we praise you and worship him. Here too, our gratitude rises for the promise of the Holy Spirit, who even yet, even now, confronts us with your claims and attracts us to your goodness. Therefore, we gladly join our voices to the song of the church on earth and in heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And now, lest we believe that our praise alone fulfills your purpose, we fall silent and remember him who came because words were not enough. Setting our wisdom, our will, our words aside, emptying our hearts and bringing nothing in our hands, we yearn for the healing, the holding, the accepting, the forgiving, which Christ alone can offer. Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and wine and fill them with the fullness of Jesus and let that same spirit rest on us converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. Amen. Amen. Among friends gathered round a table, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Later, he took a cup of wine and said, this is the new relationship with God made possible because of my death. Take it, all of you, to remember me. Jesus, firstborn of Mary. Jesus, savior of the world. Jesus, monarch of heaven. He whom the universe could not contain is present to us in this bread. He who redeemed us and called us by name now meets us in this cup. So take this bread and this wine. In them God may come to us so that we may come to God. God who has nourished us is our peace. Strangers and friends, male and female, old and young, he has broken down the barriers to bind us to him and to each other. Having experienced his goodness, let us share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be God. And now for those worshiping with us online and receiving spiritual communion. 
Dear friends, I invite this, you in this moment, wherever you may be, to receive Christ in communion with the saints and the gathering of God's people, unseen and yet present with us now, many are made one. We receive you, Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome your presence in us and together proclaim our love for you with our hearts, minds, our souls, and our strength. With the saints, we worship you. With the angels, we adore you. With your whole church, we proclaim your reign. Come to us, though many, and make us one in you. Amen. Jesus, I believe that you are present with us now in the sacrament of bread and wine. I love you, and I desire your presence afresh in my life. Since I cannot now receive the bread and wine of the altar, come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself to you. Never let me be separated from you. Amen. Our service continues on page 17 with the closing prayer. O God, our Father, who gave to your servant Columba the gifts of courage, faith, and cheerfulness, and sent people forth from the holy isle of Iona to carry the word of your gospel to every creature, grant, we pray, a like spirit to your church, even at this present time. Further in all things, the purpose of this community of St. Mark's that hidden things may be revealed to us and new ways found to touch the hearts of all. May we preserve with each other sincere charity and peace, and if it be your will, grant that this holy place of your abiding be continued still to be a sanctuary and a light. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
May the love of God fill you with joy and peace. May the healing power of Christ strengthen and save you. May the Holy Spirit encourage you. May a thousand angels guide your steps. And may a blessing from this holy place protect you all your days. Amen. Amen. And now for the lion's tale with Tracy. Our reading today comes from the book of Exodus. It is the second book in the Old Testament and is thought to have been written by Moses. In the reading, Moses is a grown man and a leader of a group of people called the Israelites. The Israelites were people who were the descendants of Abraham, who you might remember from our reading last week. The Israelites are described in Exodus as God's chosen people. God had made promises to them that one day they would live in a land of their own, but they'd had a lot of troubles in the years before today's story begins. For generations, the Israelites had lived in Egypt as slaves. Under the ruler of the land, the Pharaoh, they had no rights and were treated very badly. They were forced to work hard and were often punished. Moses was born to an Israelite couple who were, like all the Israelites there of the time, living under a terrible law that the Pharaoh had decreed. It said that all firstborn Israelite babies that were boys would not be allowed to live. So things weren't looking good for firstborn baby boy Moses. But his mother had an idea to save him. She put him into a specially waterproofed basket and put it in the River Nile, hoping that some kind person would find him and take care of him. His older sister ran along the riverbank as the basket floated along to see what would happen. It turned out that the basket was found by none other than the Pharaoh's daughter. She decided to keep him as her own. The neat part of the story is that Moses' sister actually approached Pharaoh's daughter and politely suggested a lady she knew who could look after baby Moses until he was old enough to live with his adopted mom. Can you guess who she suggested? Yep, their mom. So Moses got to live with his own family until he was old enough to be raised in the Pharaoh's palace and be educated, living a life of privilege. As a young man, lots of things happened in Moses' life. He grew up, got married, and became a shepherd. He always knew he was an Israelite, though. So when God spoke to him through a burning bush and told him he wanted Moses to go to Egypt and lead the Israelites out of slavery and get them to a land he had promised them, he agreed to do it. You might remember the story of the parting of the Red Sea that let Moses and his people escape the Egyptian army on their way to this land. Well, at the time of our reading, the Israelites were pretty fed up. Instead of seeing the wonderful things that God had done for them by helping them leave Egypt, keeping them fed and safe on their long trip to the land he promised them, they complained. They moaned about their bad luck and how it would have been better to have been slaves after all than be in the desert, traveling to their new home for such a long time. They weren't loving God in their hearts or their actions. They were only concerned about their own wants. Moses didn't know what to do with them. So, God had another conversation with him, way up on the top of Mount Sinai. Moses was gone from the Israelite camp for quite a while. When he finally returned, he was carrying something special. Two tablets carved with the rules God wanted the Israelites to live by that we heard described in the Bible reading. We are asked to live by them to this day as Christians. As followers of Jesus, we use the rules to live the way God wants us to in our actions and in our hearts, and to help to understand God better. Jesus explained that the reason for the commandments is to remember to love, to show love toward God and our neighbor. He showed us how to do that through his own actions and asks us to try to do the same. But since we aren't perfect, we're going to need Jesus and his sacrifice, his life on the cross, to help us. Our hearts aren't always in the right place. And by that I mean, we don't always feel like doing the right thing, even if we do the right thing. So if we can be more like Jesus by trying to do the right thing in our actions and in our hearts, that makes the rules easier to follow. 
And one day, when Jesus returns, everyone will live the Ten Commandments in their hearts, and the world will be a very good place. Let us pray. God, thank you for Moses and his life of service to you. Thank you for giving him the rules we live by as Christians. Help us to remember that the main point of the commandments is to love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Thank you. Amen. We continue on through Lent, and it is a, a busy time in the ministry of our parish. Uh, we took part in the Lenten lunch series this past week, and if you would like, that link is still open, and you can access it through the bulletin, which you can find online, or through a previous email to point you to that service that we uh, presided at this past week. Our Purdy's Chocolate Fundraiser carries on, as does uh, the coldest night of the year, the opportunities to help that initiative for the Orangeville Food Bank. We have a Lunch and Learn coming up on March 21st with Will Postma, the Executive Director of the Primates World Relief and Development Fund. Our confirmation classes begin today. We have four confirmands. And our food drop-off has opened up again, and you can also pick up coffee there if you'd like. One of those packages, caffeinated or decaffeinated, $2 for one, three for $5, or a whole box of 41 for $60. And we move towards the uh, joy of Easter as we carry on through Lent. Go in peace, in friendship, and hospitality, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.